So let's move on with the uh, even age layered. So we're going to deal with the even age layered uh, survey methodology. So these are when you've got some sort of uh, stand retention like you see in the photograph here, but no multiple entries. It's only a single entry. Primarily, that's the planned deal. Sometimes you, you may a single entry like this would you can meet your stocking obligation with a single entry and um, there's no need to remove any of the overstory but there might be a possibility for another pass to remove these overstory stems if operationally it makes sense that's a possibility but most nine times out of ten or 99 percent of the time uh, these stems would not be removed uh, because it's not necessarily engineered that way um, usually there's more than one layer um, and we're advocating now that uh, typically if you're in an even age layered kind of situation uh, and your primary objective is is timber uh, i.e. conifer regeneration then we're at the lower end of the retention scale so the lower basal area so in the interior something less than 10 square meters and for the coast uh, something less than 18 square meters because over these over these basal areas that are left, uh, you're really compromising on the regen layer and any uh, significant growth loss starts to happen on these higher retention layers. Now you may want to retain some of these higher retention layers, uh, higher retention basal areas for non-timber reasons and it starts to really compromise the, uh, the objective of growing conifers on the site. And so typically in the layered approach, it's an even-aged management regime, so you're even, using even-aged stocking standards. Um, again, typically there's no minimum inter-tree distance for layer ones. They're already established, they're already growing, uh, they're slowing down their growth probably, and uh, just maintaining uh, an existing type of situation. And uh, that would, uh, so we count them all. And you tally all layers without nesting, so the nesting doesn't apply in this situation. But statistics does apply. There is the rigor around uh, meeting um, lower confidence limit calculation once you uh, do tally up your plots. And so the same process applies for, for using statistical analysis as you would for even age clear cut type of situation. I click it to advance it kind of hesitates a little bit but that's okay there we go so the survey procedure so usually you select the best crop trees first regardless of the layer so you sort of start in your sweep and uh, if it's a layer one it's a layer one if it's a layer two or three it's a that's that's the way it goes so you select the one that's going to be there at the rotation age as long as you have a clarity around when that rotation age is or what the management regime is for that stand um, except the layer one as a crop tree only if it's judge capable of contributing to the merchantable volume to the next rotation and, and that gets reflected in the damage uh, criteria that we're recommending for these types of stands um, so there's no minimum intertree distance for layer one unless you've got something in your SP and then again I have to uh, reiterate that those are whatever's in the earth civil culture prescription or your forest stewardship plan will, will trump anything that I'm saying here today. These are basically guidelines or, or starting points to uh, give you some sort of guidance on uh, an appropriate practice, best practice one might say, but uh, local differences or product objectives or, or values may trump any of these procedures. So again, it's, it's, it's a recommended practice. It's a foundation from which to to build from, put it that way. Um, I'm recommending the drip line concept for uh, the next layers, layer two, three, and four, in in relationship to layer one, and uh, and so that concept is basically if this is a layer one tree on the right, um, the outside of the crown, if the pith of the region underneath is outside of the the crown, then that's acceptable. If, if, if you had a two meter intertree distance and this was two meters here, then that tree would not 
count, but if uh, unless it was outside of the drip line. Um, so that's that's the concept. Uh, in between layers, if you have other layers out here between two, three, and four between themselves, then your minimum entry tree would apply if it's usually two, if it is, or whatever is written in your silviculture prescription. So here we go. Here's another virtual plot and uh, 3.99 meter radius. And we're going to use a layered approach, a little bit more diversity than our first plot, uh, but more complexity. We're not too sure. We've got a couple of different species here. Tried to show these folks as pine and these pointy ones as spruce. Um, so we've got two layer ones, as we can see, and we're accepting them as well spaced and free growing. They meet the damage criteria that we have for this for this block, for this opening, and they're both pines. Um, so I just kind of started there, and I'm kind of be working down through layers here, but you can it doesn't you pick the best tree that 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 goes. This one's not the best one on the planet. It's a layer I only have one layer two and uh, I'm going to count him. He's not too bad. He's got some infections on the lower branches and doesn't pass the acceptability for free growing because it's got uh, mistletoe. So, but I'm going to count it as a well spaced because otherwise I'd have a bit of a gap over here for well spaced. Um, but it's not too bad of an infection. I'm thinking it might grow out of it. We're not too sure. So then I'm going to look at layer three and. Uh, uh, these two are too close together, so I can only take this one here. Oh, and I've got two layer threes. Where's the other layer three? Nope, nope, not that one. So, oh yes, there's just two here, that's right. So we're going to tally that as two, but we only have one well spaced. And um, so that goes into the column. So I'm not nesting at all. There's no caps for each layer or anything like that. So we've got seven layer fours, um, but I'm only counting one well spaced. Um, I can't accept that one because it's uh, too close to this pine and, and susceptible to the mistletoe. Um, so I'll take that spruce. And I can't accept these other ones because they're within the drip line. And so our magic blue cone of drip line went up there, or cylinder, and it discounts these individuals who are underneath the drip line. And, and technically too close within that growing space of these individuals. So we end up with uh, only one layer of four in the plot. Um, our tally, we add up straight down without any nesting. We have five, um, we have five well spaced and three free growing. And I didn't cap those, uh, normally if it was a 12 and seven stocking standard then uh, we're under uh, 600 or 6 per plot which would be our M value. And I'm, I'm ripping along through all of these things about M value and I'm not explaining them because I'm assuming you're experienced surveyors. Okay and so um, that's how the plot works. Let's move on to the damage criteria and, and where we've landed with this is really recommended that we use the Cedrus damage criteria, single entry dispersed retention, and we've amended that, that coastal procedure to include interior species. And the advantages and the, the reason we landed in that as a recommended uh, damage criteria, because it's, it, it's separated by layers one and it groups the layer two, three, and four together, and it really works quite well um, in these kind of uh, lower basal area kind of group stands. Um, Crop trees in all layers must be healthy until the next rotation. And, um, you know, on the coast for a layer, it could be as low as 50 years or, or, you know, in the interior as high as 80. So that's basically how a layered survey works. Pretty straightforward. A few tweaks and rigor, and again, recommending that it, it be at the lower end of the basal area class. Okay, so now we're going to try to lose everybody and dive into deviation from potential or DFP. Maybe I can just use, can I get away with using the acronym DFP? I hope so. So just give you an ex explanation of where that's coming from. If you think of my son is, um, you know, he's in the 
workforce age and uh, emulating the potential to be a finance business whiz and make all kind of money, but um, he actually deviates from his potential, my perceived perception of his potential, I guess, which not, might not be true or, or not, but uh, he, he's deviating about 20%. He's, uh, he's chosen to be a bit of a skateboarder and, uh, and um, ex examine life a little bit and, and not quite ready to meet his potential. But he's not totally dysfunctional in the context of uh, uh, still coming home at night and, uh, and still uh, maintaining a certain amount of finances and working a little bit of part-time but just having fun. So he's, he's actually, I'm thinking he's about 20% away from his, his potential. And that's the whole concept is where's that threshold of tolerance of how much you're willing to accept <laughs> or feel comfortable with uh, a deviation from the full potential of the growing capacity of the site. And so this survey methodology really captures uh, where you are on that scale of, of deviating from um, your growing stock potential. So DFP-related surveys are primarily targeted towards even-aged management. Really, that's where it goes to. It's, it's those types of stands and we're recommending that it's it's more appropriate for stands that have some more some uh, busyness about them. Uh, it's not really what we want for growing timber, but for some reason the overstory has been left. And and in reality, um, you know, we have to get some credit to the folks who developed this methodology. Um, it was primarily it came through the UBC. Uh, it's UBC at, in uh, Williams Lake with Ken Day and Pat Martin here in, in Victoria. Ken Zelke, Bryce Bancroft, Kim Peel worked on this relationship between basal area and the overstory and region and the understory in the interior. John Presek and uh, Nelson or uh, Cranbrook as well. Still doing quite a bit of work on this and I think this, it's deployed a fair bit in, in certain necks of the woods in the southern interior and TFLs as well. But you know what, in reality, and it's been stated several times, it, it's not really a super duper stocking standard. It's a great measure of occupancy. It's, a, it's almost an appropriate measure of occupancy, but translated all the mechanics and the convolutions of a stocking standard, it gets a little clunky. Um, and so from that context, we're really advocating here in Victoria that it, it's better for you know disturbed salvage sites that are um, an after event and uh, lacking maybe a full prescription or a targeted intent. Uh, it's, it's convenient in that way to measure how are we doing as far as uh, occupying the site and having good growing stock. Um, and again, you know, as I mentioned, more recommended for areas with moderate or high retention requirements and with non-timber values. I think this is where we, we can get to really measuring the impact of the overstory to the understory and, and how much are we willing to deviate from the growing potential in that site and the reduction, reduction in growth depending on the species in the understory. So those are some of the concepts that way. It really intended for those areas with higher levels of stocking diversity and, and retention. So just let's get into the concept a little bit more. Um, it's an index. DFP is an index which represents a deviation from the potential growing space as a percentage. And so we can look at it from if we had full stocking occupancy in, in a block, we would have a deviation from potential of 0%. We haven't deviated at all from its potential growing space. Um, if we have no occupancy at all, uh, nothing there. There's nothing in the overstory, there's nothing in the understory. We've really deviated from the potential, uh, a, a number of one or a hundred percent. So those are the, you know, the, the parameters, the outside ones. And again, it's a great measure. I, th I think it's a really good measure of site occupancy. It looks into the biology of trees and, and most deviation from potential tables that we've generated so far are species specific and um, site index related and so they're targeted and modeled that way. So it, it's a two-stage assessment process 
we separate the steps and so it's a blend of a variable radius plot so you're using assessment of basal area and the overstory the first step layer one and then the second step is a understory well space density using a fixed radius plot and you count all of the stems outside of the drip line so we're using the drip line concept that I already introduced in the layered survey in the earlier section of this uh, presentation and again the same concept is illustrated above in the diagram showing uh, the region that's acceptable outside of the drip line so uh, again DFP a two-stage analysis and takes three people to do the plots as you can see here they're all busy and confused and uh, and our plot center, I think, is where that shovel is in the center. Well, there's two shovels, yes, so we don't lose one shovel. And uh, so the first step, again, is the prism sweep. How many of the trees are in in layer one? We determine a basal area within that plot. And the second step is the 3.99, one two hundredth of a hectare understory regen plot. So it's just two, two step phases. And after those two steps is when you determine your deviation from potential value. So here's our. Uh, our plot, we whip up our prism like that in our first step, and uh, that's our only tree that's in. If we whip the prism over to the right, the far tree, and this side would probably be out. So in the prism suite, this is an in tree, and just to give you that, that concept. So bring a prism or download the app for your iPad for 40 bucks, and you can calibrate your prism for whatever basal area factor, bath, would be appropriate for the stand that you're in. So continue the uh, deviation potential procedures. There's no minimum intertree distance for layer one. Again, a consistent factor that we've seen in the previous two survey methodologies we talked about, I talked about. Um, cane stems that contribute to stocking must be healthy. Again, a, a, a very similar underlying principle. Um, no statistics. So we get a reprieve here, again, from statistics. And the stocking decisions are, are made up of uh, two phases. There's two aspects to most of the stocking uh, decisions that you have to make that I've seen in uh, deviation for potential standards around the province. And, and it's uh, very parallel, similar to what goes on with single entry dispersed retention as well. So the first one in the stocking decision is the threshold DFP value must be achieved, whatever that may be. It's either, either a single digit uh, value, uh, two or a percent, or I should say 0 0.2 or a percent, like 20%. And then the second decision is the proportion of plots within the stocking categories. And again, you don't really know what that means until I explain the next chart and go over the stocking categories. So, um, And the main reason for these proportion of the stocking categories is to address the sample variation and the amount of open area within a block. Of course, within these retention blocks, complex retention blocks, you get soup to nuts, you get open areas all the way to not even touched, nothing removed, complete canopy closure, and everything in between, and any combination within several 10 meters or so of each other. So in order to address that sample variation, we advocate that the stocking uh, or, you know, survey design be intense, be rigorous, uh, one plot per hectare, and, uh, and since we don't have statistics being involved here, that, that should help address the variation. So that was in the original design with the folks with Ken Day. So here's the interior table that was developed, and uh, in the, as you can see in this example, we have across the top, we have the understory density along the top. Um, in this case, it's calibrated with well spaced trees per plot. We're assuming that's a 3.99 meter radius plot. And then on the left hand side, so we go down, we go across, across the top, and then we go down the left hand side, we go from basal area from 0 to 30. And so you can see with uh, zero basal area, let's just, just work with that one. That one really kind of helps to explain it a little bit. If we had nothing in the overstory, if we had nothing in the understory, so we had a zero 
the overstory is zero and the understory, we had a hundred percent deviation from potential, and that's what I was talking about earlier. Um, the other end of the spectrum is if we had nothing in the overstory, zero, but we had eight trees in our plot, ooh, packed to the hilt. We have not deviated from the potential at all. We are at full occupancy. So that's what this graph displays. And of course, it's a graduation. As your basal area goes up, your, your taller, your sort of threshold of what's, what's stocked and what is not starts to slide over to the left until we get to the point where we've got so much in the overstory, uh, right at 20 square meters, that we're already stocked. We're almost with, within our threshold. And of course, when we're right up to uh, 30 square meters and nothing, in the understory, we've we have no deviation from potential. So the whole exercise is where is the threshold? Where is our tolerance for how far we're willing to deviate from the full occupancy potential zero and zero? You can see that makes a little bit. If I can connect the dots here, there's a little bit of a hoop, a bend like that, almost a graph. Um, looks like we've drawn the line here where this yellow band is and where the gray starts. This would be sort of our tolerance line. So this is an example of uh, criteria for um, an occupancy standard or stocking standard if you want to call it that. There's in the interior a good example of this is a four stage criteria. The first one would be that the average DFP, so cumulatively and what the average would be across all of your plots. Say you had a 10 hectare block and you had 10 plots, you would have, excuse me, drink of water there, uh, average, so if you average the plots and your tolerance would be that you would have to have less than or equal to 20% loss of growing potential. So a DFP value of 0.2 or 20%. So I'm not going to tolerate anything more than that. Uh, I can tolerate less. It's great to have less. And, you know, zero is great. That, that's perfect. We're, we're packed. But I'm willing to take a 20% hit. You can skateboard 20% of the time, but the rest of the time you've got to be in the boardroom. So um, then we enter these other criteria that they do have in the interior. We modified it a little bit for the coast, but so percentage of those plots, of those 10 plots, we want to have at least um, equal to or greater than 60% in the stocked criteria, which is be the dark gray. We have a percentage in the part, partly stocked, which would be the yellow, which is somewhere between target and minimum. You could use that as an analogy. And and far less than 20% in the open plots. So we don't want a lot of open area. So um, this emulates what a stocking standard and, and what the data that you would collect and summarize when you're summarizing a silviculture survey using DFP in the interior. Okay, let's do a magical uh, virtual plot here. And um, you can see I've got my handy DFP table on the right hand side and, and of course you can't read that but that's okay you don't have to I'll just sort of show you the relationship of how you would go through the plot so again we start off with um, do a prism sweep again the DFP is a two phase a variable radius and a uh, um, fixed radius we could technically have this, if this is our 3.99 meter radius plot this tree could be outside of 3.99, but would be in your sweep. And that might be something I should design in the next virtual plot just to illustrate that. But it, it makes sense because it's a variable radius plot. And most folks who are familiar with sampling would, would get that. So we've got three trees in our plot, uh, a layer ones. But you know what? Uh, only two are crop trees. This one's got so much mistletoe infection that it doesn't meet uh, damage criteria. So we've got three in our prism sweep, but we only got two crop trees. That's a pivotal uh, point I'm trying to illustrate here. So as you can see, uh, with a BAF 5, if I was using a BAF 5, basal area factor 5, um, I had three trees, so actually my total basal area is 
15, but my crop tree volume's 10. So that's what we use in order to, to move forward to our next step. We use our, our crop tree volume. So I'm just using these two guys. It's important to tally this guy because you get an idea of the total basal area. This one's not really contributing to stocking at all. It's not contributing to, to growing because it's too damaged. But it's really, it's occupying growing space. It negates you possibly using this one unless it's totally dead. There's no foliage. But it's still occupying growing space, especially with mistletoe. You still have green foliage. So this is a key point to remember. Um, so first step, overstory, 10 square meters. Second step, what have we got in the understory layer? So cumulatively, layer two, three, and four, we add them all up together. It's suggested to separate them in your tally because then you can report them into results separately and it makes a little bit more sense to separate it out. But collectively, we're just gonna add them up for this upper layer. So we're almost nesting here in a way for this, uh, uh, sorry, not upper layer, for this upper segment of the, the diagram. So we've got two well spaced in the understory. Um, and we apply the uh, drip line rule even to the uh, non-crop tree as I mentioned earlier. So we can't take that one, we can't take this one, can't take that one, can't take that one. Can't take that one because it's too close to this one because of the damage criteria is within 10 meters of a mistletoe infected tree. If you read the damage criteria that's where you have to go with that. And this one is, this one's too close to that one because it's less than the minimum intertree distance. So we end up with really just these two well-spaced trees. So we have a two on the, on the understory. So we've got a value on both axes of the uh, table here. And we come up with a deviation from potential value for that plot. That's what we need to know. That's our DFP for that plot. And that's all we need to know for that plot. We, that's all we have to record is 0.32 for that plot. So 0.32 is actually below 0.2 if that was my standard. So it's below 20%. So I got 32% deviation from potential. And it makes sense. Look at this hole in this side of the plot. There's absolutely nothing over there. Uh, we got a bit of a hole in growing space. Um, Maybe you want to plant a tree over in here. I don't know. We'll see how that works. And, and again, you should be tallying plantable spots while you're doing this as well. That's the rigor we expect or one would want. So that's how it works. Um, when you finish doing multiple plots, um, you come up with an average deviation from potential for the entire opening or SU that you're surveying and you see if it meets that criteria that we previously had mentioned. Okay, so let's just talk about damage criteria. Now, again, there's a little bit of a blending here. Um, I've seen in stocking standards around the province um, for deviation from potential, and uh, they haven't embraced some of the other damage criteria that I recommend, but that's okay. I mean, they're approved in uh, forest stewardship plans, and that's the way it goes. So, the ones I've seen there uses they use a, a bit of a blend of even age damage criteria with with age class for age class one with the uh, layer one wounding criteria from the wounding guidebook. So, it, it's. Um, so it addresses the separation a little bit from for layer one and layer two, but we're recommending if you're going to use a deviation from potential option for the coast that you use the uh, the sedrous damage criteria, the single entry dispersed retention damage criteria, which I'll explain in the next little section. Um, typically, again, in the uh, um, in the interior for deviation from potential, there's been some. Uh, acceptance that uh, minimum heights achievement for free growing have been reduced uh, some points to a third in order to account for those lower light levels in the understory and the slower growth rates in this uh, in the same time period for stands without without retention you know it's always two meters in the open but maybe it should be more like uh, 1.7 if it's underneath a canopy of uh, 
stems in the overstory. These have been accepted in four stewardship plans around the province. Some aspects of that are controversial, and I'll leave that up to your um, decision as to where to go with that debate um, and uh, where that is a possibility for misuse, but it, it does make sense depending on the shade tolerance of the species that you're engaged with, that's for sure.